Thank you for joining us and welcome to the Auto Guide Show brought to you by eBay Motors. This week, Kyle goes on a bunch of first drives. I drive a car that doesn't fully work. BMW has a new concept. Mazda has an interesting patent. And we sit down with Infinity to talk about the new QX80. But first, a word from our sponsor. eBay Motors is here for the ride. Your elbow grease, fresh installs, and a whole lot of love transformed 100,000 miles and a body full of rust into a driveway entirely its own. Brake kits, LED headlights, whatever you need, eBay Motors has it. And with the eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. Okay, so let's get into it. We do have a lot to cover. Um, Kyle, you've been pretty much not living at home the last month. So uh, the first first drive we'll cover is the new Santa Fe, which I'm very intrigued about. Yeah, I don't blame you because um, the, the main point about the Santa Fe since they've shown it is, I mean, look at it. It doesn't look anything at all like the one that came before. And it's really strange. This was my first time really getting up close with it. And one of the things that really shocked me once I saw it is it seems like it's palisade sized, right? Because of how boxy it is, but it's actually still quite a lot shorter. It's closer in length to the old model than a palisade. It's just that it looks so much bigger. And the result is like a pretty usable third row. It's not as big as a palisades, but it's close. And uh, yeah, I mean, the, the general vibe is much more of an off-roader, but I will say that that's more of a cosplaying thing. <laughs> Did you get to drive the regular and what do they call their off-roaders? XRT, I think? Yes, XRT. Uh, so we drove both the top trim, the calligraphy or ultimate calligraphy in Canada, and the XRT. Um, we didn't do any serious off-roading. We did a logging road just uh, a couple hours northwest of Vancouver. Um, it's fine. Like the, the thing is, is I could complain about how this isn't really doing much for off-road. It, it has different tires and that's about it. Um, but I think that's fine for most buyers. I don't think most people who are buying this really care that much. Yeah. I, I was talking with another manufacturer uh, the other day and we were commenting on how these off-road specials all seem to be the better ones to drive. And a lot of that has to do with their squishier all-terrain tires. And some of them have softer suspensions, like the, the Subaru Wildernesses, the CX-50 uh, Meridian, the Track Haw or sorry, Trailhawks, these. I think it's because wheels, tires, and suspensions have just all got so stiff. And then when you get in something like this, you're like, oh, this ride's so nice. So I agree, normally. Um, there isn't much of a difference, surprisingly, between the XRT and the calligraphy in terms of ride quality. And that's pretty impressive since this the uh, calligraphy runs on 21 inch wheels. So it's a little firmer, but not much. And I would probably still steer towards that one only because you get a lot more nice features inside, comfy interior. It's a really pretty, very cool kind of nature-esque vibe to the interior because it's got a dark green and cream uh, color scheme. But we did notice even on this trip, it's really easy to get that dirty. So as nice as it is, I don't know if I'd actually take that for daily use. Yeah, I'd never get a, a light cream or white or, or any or light beige. They get dirty and worn out so fast. Did you um, did you use that step handle thing on the back for at all? I did. Uh, I mean, I mostly just used it to check it out and see how easy it is to get access to the, the roof. And it is useful. And I do like that they've locked it so people can't fiddle with it or anything like that. Oh. It, it is lockable. So there's there's a lot of really clever features in the Santa Fe. And I think what's really impressive is very little of it outside of the design is actually new. Like it's got that, um, that germ killing little cubby uh, on the mm. passenger side. We've seen that in the Genesis G90 before. There's dual wireless chargers. There's a lot of stuff that we've seen elsewhere in the family, but it's all grouped together here. And it's um, it's a really nice overall family package. I do find it very strange that uh, Canada is taking a different approach to America when it comes to hybrid versus the turbo. Yeah. Our 
base trims, our two lowest trims are hybrid in Canada, and then the rest are 2.5 turbo only, and that's what we drove. And then in the US, you can get the hybrid as an optional powertrain on any trim except XRT. Yeah, one last comment since you're on the drivetrains. I have seen a lot of complaints, and I think it's because of what you said, how it's boxier and looks bigger, of people saying, oh, it doesn't have a V6, I don't want it. The Santa Fe hasn't had a V6 in quite a while, and it has more power now. But I guess just the look, you, people assume it should be this big V6 powered vehicle, but that turbo, well, I mean, you drove it. It sounds like it's got more than enough power for it. Well, and I mean, it has more torque than their V6 in the Palisade. So realistically, you're getting about the same power as you would in the larger Palisade. So I think it's plenty fine for day to day. Yeah, and in that Palisade and its twin, the well, not twin, its cousin, the Telluride, the engine's probably one of the weaker points of the vehicle. So it's not like it's this amazing engine that, you know, like, anyway. Yeah. All right, moving on. Speaking of four-cylinder turbos, you also drove the new Ford Ranger. I did, yes. It was part of a very abbreviated uh, adventure in Salt Lake City because travel, air travel is not great in March. Um, but yeah, I got to drive both versions of the Ranger, which I'll talk about in a couple minutes. But first, the regular version, which is, in my mind, vastly improved, but I'm sh not sure if that's enough to make it segment leader still. Um, the old Ranger was just old. It, it was very old, right? It showed up here pretty late in its life and it was designed for other markets and it was just sort of adapted for the US. Whereas this generation has been a much more global effort and I think it looks great. I think it looks much better than the old one. And there's a lot of just smart detail changes. It's an adapted version of the previous platform, but it has a wider stance and a longer wheelbase. So it just rides a little more maturely. So this is um, not a, a real concern or really affect the truck, but I always found the one it just replaced didn't look that big or imposing. Like, I don't mean it needed to look like an F-150, but when you looked at it, you kind of thought, does it hold much more than a Maverick? And it just seemed like tall and long, but really narrow. Does this feel more substantial? This does, yeah. A lot of it has to do with the... Um the changes up front, right? It no longer has that smooth, sloped uh, nose. It's a lot more uh, cliff-like. That being said, it's not super high, right? Because I mean, full-size trucks now are kind of ridiculously tall. Yeah. So this does strike a really nice balance where, I mean, for me, like growing up in the 90s, this feels more or less like what a truck should be in terms of size and proportions. There is only one cab style now, at least at launch. So you just get the, the four-door and you get the five-foot bed. Um, Maybe more will come because I know there's more for other markets, but it seems like that's probably the smart play because that's where most people are going to be getting a truck. So I, I think that's okay right now. Yeah, most uh, like the segments going that way. Very few competitors offer more than one style. And I mean, it looks like it fits between the Maverick and the F-150 better. The problem for midsize trucks has always been pricing. So we'll have to wait and see where it falls and if it gets the same sort of uh, discounts and incentives and packages as this bigger brother. That's, yeah, that's always the tough thing, right? And and pricing is okay for the Ranger. It could seem a little expensive, but also you do get a, a fair amount of standard kits. So I think, yeah, we'll, we'll see. I think it's a much better offering and Ford needs a strong offering because it's the truck company. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm very curious to see how people accept it. And I mean, there's now an optional there will be an optional Turbo V6 above the nice. Turbo 4, which uh, it's the 27 that is in the Bronco and the F-150. So I think that will appeal to people, especially who are towing more regularly, right? Because it's 400 pound feet of torque. Maybe they can bring back the Splat, have a, a sport truck Ranger. Heck yes. Okay, so next uh, we go to a review I did of the Alfa Romeo Giulia. I always pronounce it wrong. Um, the Veloc um, two-wheel drive. So the Q yeah. Oh, is, it, is that what it is? Yeah. Oh. Um, it was the Q2, which uh, had the badging on the back, which I was surprised like it's promoting it's the, the rear-wheel drive. But I was excited because I've never driven a rear-wheel drive version. So this is the, the absolute dead middle trim. There's two below and two above. I mean, the top one with the, the big crazy turbo and everything. That's sort of a separate car, really. Mm -hmm. um, this comes with this, the two liter 
280 horsepower four cylinder uh, that all the rest come with. I mean, it'd be kind of nice if there's an in-between engine, but this this feels like powerful. Um, mm -hmm. Compared to the 330 and the C300, which would be pretty direct competitors, it has more power. And um, in like sort of the mid-range and highway driving, you can really feel it. And the transmission works incredibly well. If you put it in, um, you know, Alpha's have the DNA for their drive modes. So you put in dynamic, upshifts are almost dual clutch transmission fast. Downshifts are still a bit of a lag as you feel it go through. But I was surprised how much more I enjoyed driving with the paddles in the simulated manual mode than I expected. Um, the Another big surprise is the uh, ride handling balance is so good in this. Um, this had the upgraded staggered summer tires so i expected it would be more handling bias but i constantly had four or five people in this car the entire week um granted two were always kids and a lot of the adults were um shorter but we drove three hours uh twice in one day with five people and no one complained about comfort uh the the trunk opening is really wide and tall so i could get two full-size suitcases inside by side which i was not expecting um it's just a a really good car and a really good alternative to the Germans. The problem is <laughs> the car didn't work the entire week uh, fully. So uh, you'll see if someone reads the review, the center console buttons, dials, and knobs didn't work as, as soon as I got it for the entire week. So I couldn't use any of the center controls except for the DNA selector. When I turn it off at night, it would chime at me that I left my headlights on, even though it was an auto. And if I physically moved it to off, it would still keep chiming. It didn't matter. I turned off the auto high beams on the infotainment system through the menus and it said it was off, but the driver information center always said it was on. And I got a check engine light on my last day. So I don't know. Is It could be a one-off. It could be like a flash or program or just a computer that's, because they're also randomly not connected. Um, who knows? I looked online and there's the odd person who's experienced these different issues, but no one that seems to have them all. So um, they're going to take it to the dealer and get it looked at. I know you've driven it and other people have driven different versions and not had issues. So this could be a one off, but I hope to get in one again later because, um, you know, I'd like to see what it, it feels like fully operational, but it still was, it still was really good. And if, it fully worked. I would really recommend this in the segment because the one thing I haven't talked about, which is obvious, is the looks. Like nothing looks as good as this in the segment. It is no. <laughs> such a good looking car. And the amount of compliments I got on its looks, the five dial wheels, or they call them five hole wheels or whatever. Yeah, like it's just it was really unfortunate that it had those um gremlins in it. That's uh too bad. But I'm happy to hear that it works pretty well as like a family vehicle despite being a sedan. That's that's a positive. Yeah, no, I mean, if I if I knew that they were completely trouble-free, it'd be a great uh, family purchase down the road, especially used. But we'll see. Like I said, I mean, this could have been a one-off car, but, you know, it happened to me, so i got to report that it happened. It's our job. All right. Uh, we'll get long on the segment, but quickly, there <laughs> is a new class BMW. Yes. Yes. I saw this... Um... Podcast listeners have known that I went to an event with BMW in Europe last month and drove a bunch of vehicles. This was also there. It was super secret. They took our phones uh, and it took a while before we could actually uh, talk about it. But here we are. And it's the, yeah, it's the Neue Klasse X. So it is the SUV version of their upcoming new generation of EVs. Uh, you're looking at something that's roughly x3 x5 shaped and it's about or sorry sized and it's in bmw's words about 90 percent of what we're going to see the final product look like but uh yeah i i only got a little bit of time around it but i have to say i i like it i i actually really enjoy it bmw is taking a much simpler cleaner design approach and for the savs going forward, you're going to get the little narrow uh, kidney grill there that you see in the one picture for people who are watching the video, in, as opposed to the Neue Klasse sedan, which is actually a very elongated kidney grill that kind of incorporates the headlights as well. It just takes up the whole width of the front fascia. Um, so I really enjoy that they're going to be doing that to differentiate the SUVs from the sedans. 
And obviously, I mean, they had to start with the sedan because it's BMW. They have to prove that they still do sports sedans. But the SUVs are going to be the big seller. Yeah, for sure. Um, this is obviously, like you said, going to replace probably the three, 3 Series X3, maybe even more. Um, did they give any sort of timeline when these are going to start coming out? We should see the production versions of both by the end of this year. I'm not sure about oh, wow. actually going to buy them, but yeah, we'll be seeing that soon. And it, and it has the same features inside, or a lot of the same features as we've seen in the Noia Class concept last year. So it has a, a full width head up display um, at the bottom of the windshield that gives you a ton of information and the passenger information. It will be interesting to see how BMW adapts that based on some uh, European safety uh, regulations that are coming into effect soon because the interior doesn't have a whole lot of physical buttons, but that's going to be more of a requirement moving forward. Um, mm -hmm. It's a it's a very pretty interior. I don't have a picture there to show, and <laughs> listeners aren't going to see it anyway. But um, yeah, BMW has been just killing it with really great, really interesting, different interiors, and this concept continues that trend. I'm really hoping that we see a lot of that in the production model because the iX is still one of the best interiors that I've sat in in years. And so if it's more like that, then I think I think BMW will have a very appealing EV lineup that really separates it out from the rest of the luxury EV segment. Sounds good. And our last story, because we're running a bit long here, yes. is another Ranger. But this one is the Ranger Raptor. This is the most fun I've had off-road in a long time. <laughs> um, we got to drive the Ranger Raptor at the new... Oh, sorry, there is construction outside of my building. Uh, sorry about that. There is a new Ranger Raptor Assault School, and that's where we went to drive these. It's a kind of a cringy name, but the Raptor itself is hilarious fun. The important thing to note with the Ranger Raptor is that it is six inches narrower than an F-150 Raptor. So it's a lot easier to maneuver off-road. And we did that. We did a rocky trail and an F-150 was leading. And you can see that it's you know barely making it through. You might have to cut away a little bit at the trail to get around narrower sections. The Ranger just powers on through. It's, it's very maneuverable. And then we did a Baja course, which was just a blast because it was slick and fun. And the Ranger has a ton of different drive modes. Baja mode puts it into rear drive. You'd think that might be a little tough, but actually it's so predictable and fun. Uh, like it'll it'll get completely sideways, but you always feel in control. And yeah, we were just, we were laughing. Both my drive partner and I were constantly laughing throughout everything. And it is a little pricey, but I think if you compare that as, in terms of fun, there are very few uh, vehicles at this price that are as fun as a Ranger Raptor, as long as you have the right setting to take part in the fun. Yeah, if you're surprised at an expensive Raptor by this point, then you haven't been paying attention to the other models. Um, <laughs> just two things quick. Yeah, I drove a F-150 Raptor R at the Midwest Automotive uh, Journalist Spring Rally. And they had a very tight course. And that one, they even told you beforehand, you had a three-point turn a bunch of places because it was so <laughs> tight. Um, the other one is, what was the school called? Uh, the Ranger Raptor Assault School. Oh. I mean, <laughs> first off, they missed the opportunity to be the Assault Academy. It would just be the AA. But that sounds like they're going full dodge there. Yeah. Anyway, we got to wrap this up. We've talked yes. about cars too long. So we will take a quick break and be back with a summarized version of the news. All right, let's get into the news. Uh, there wasn't anything too crazy this week, except for this first story. Our sleuth, uh, Dennis, again, found another patent. And in Europe, Mazda filed 6E. Now, Mazda 6 is the obvious first choice of what this might be because they had that sedan. And although we haven't had it for quite a while in North America, it still exists in other places. So could this be a new electric? Six, could this be what they're going to call the six plug-in hybrid? Could this just refer to what they're going to call their engine going forward because um, it's a mild hybrid? Who knows? Yeah, who knows? I uh, Doing the research when we found out about this, 
yeah, the, the regular six is actually just going out of production very soon in Japan. And I know there were rumors years ago when the CX-90 platform was being developed, that there would be a sedan counterpart. So here I am hoping that, you know, Mazda makes a three series essentially and makes a rear drive biased sedan and then there's a EV version. But yeah, we, we don't know, but we want to know. Yeah, I mean, just stick with the same drivetrains the 70 and 90 have, and then also add an EV on top. I mean, I take a 340 horsepower rear drive <laughs> Mazda 6. It's important to note, too, that it's not called the 6 in Japan, so that doesn't really make sense there either, because they, I'm pretty sure they still call it the Atenza. They, um, uh, they switched it very recently. Oh, um, so they, d- they dumped that name? Globally is now, they're doing the numbers. Uh, yeah, which is a little sad. I always liked Atenza. Yeah, no, it is sad. But yeah, hopefully what won't be sad is what it comes on, unless it's just a uh, engine name. Yeah. So moving on, um, there was uh, a fatal crash involving someone potentially using a semi-autonomous driver assist system, and it wasn't a Tesla. So this is interesting. This was actually a Ford Mustang Mach-E, um, which is very similar circumstances. And although people think, uh, the media, the government, everyone picks on Tesla. It's just their cars were doing it first much longer. This mm-hmm. is another automaker. We don't know if it was using the Blue Cruise or just regular, but this is going to uh, happen more and more as these systems get um, wider and wider availability. Uh, I know they're getting more and more sophisticated, but um, as we talked about last week, most of the manufacturers aren't making them good enough to just let a driver not pay attention. And drivers are falsely under the impression they can not pay attention. It's just helping you. It's not taking over. And even the same with the full self-driving, there's no such system that can fully drive you without you paying attention. There's eventually going to be an issue. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. That, uh, you, you mentioned it like the thing last week about how 13 out of 14 systems failed in terms of, uh, the IAHS, we have a long way to go, and unfortunately, it's a huge knowledge gap and where most most of the public does believe that these things can more or less drive themselves, and, and we know that that's so far from the case. Yeah, and feel like, oh, they could drive themselves for certain distances. Any car can. Um, Kias and Hyundais and Teslas, you can have, have them drive with no driver for a short couple feet towards you, but that doesn't mean you rely on the <laughs> system without paying attention. Will we get there one day? Sure. Anytime soon, who knows? Maybe. All right, moving on to Mercedes AMG has released the, uh, I guess they call it new, but I'd say it's heavily updated uh, AMG GT. And the 43 has something very interesting in it. Yes, two interesting things. It loses power to the front wheels, which sounds like a good thing because that's what the first generation did. Uh, and then it ditches the V8 for a two liter turbo four cylinder. Yeah, I mean, I'll kind of miss the all-wheel drive because we live where it's supposed to snow, even though it didn't really this year. So it's always nice having that option. But um, this is interesting because I remember, this is way back when I was a teenager, and yeah, I'd be watching um, the old Speed Vision, and we'd be watching the WRC rallies uh, all around the world, and you'd see the, you know, the the WRX STIs and the Evo 3s and 4s racing. You'd be like, holy cow, almost 300 horsepower of a 2-liter. That's insane. I mean, now we're getting, what, 411 or something in, in a production car? Four cylinders have come a long way. Yeah, yeah. I think like, I, I I sneer a little bit, not that I'm ever the target audience for Mercedes and AMG. I know that. But going to a four-cylinder is not going to sound as nice. But on the plus side, it's going to be a lot lighter. You're, you're ditching uh, all-wheel drive, and your engine is half the size. So it mm-hmm. should actually be a pretty fun, agile vehicle and i know reading from some of the first drives of the the full fat version that some people said it's a little too accomplished a little too good at what it does so i'm this this might be a a hidden gem right who knows yeah and the old engine was turbo too so you can't say you know the turbo makes up for the weight so you're right it it will be lighter um i'm sure inside there'll be some sort of uh sound coming through the speakers to combine with the engine noise to make it sound more appealing, but on the outside, it, it'll sound like what it is. Yeah. And speaking of sound, the yeah. last of the SRT-based 6.4 liter 
fun cars for Mopar is going away. We've already lost all of the cars and we've lost, I think, all the SUVs now because the Durango's done. So this is it, the 392. Yep, yep. The uh, yeah, the Durango's on its uh, final editions or, yeah, things like that, the Alchemy. Uh, and yeah, now the Wrangler 392, which is a ridiculous vehicle. We always knew this was never going to last for a long time, right? Like <laughs> sticking a 6.4 V8 in a Wrangler is bonkers. It's fun. And like I was saying with the Ranger Raptor, it is genuine laugh out loud kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. Especially with the Rubicon, because the suspension is so soft for off-roading. When you pinned it, the whole car just arced way back on its rear suspension. You're looking at the sky for a second or two while you're flying down the road. Um, at that rally, we are talking about the Raptor R. This was there, too. And this was the other one in the three-point turn. Not because it was overly long, but it was just so wide. You couldn't yeah. get it around some corners. Yeah, this one is but. nuts. It's it's six figures, but I'm sure they're going to sell every single one of them. Oh, yeah. These, uh, what is it, like 3000 or something they're making? Um, yeah. These will depreciate for a few years, and then they'll immediately be back to what they cost. And that's if they even depreciate. Like buying one of these and driving it a little bit, you'll make your money back in a couple of years. Any Absolutely. of these last call, last generations, because they'll never make something like this again. No, they'll be faster, more capable versions, but they'll probably be electric or hybrid at a minimum. So, exactly, yeah. All right. So the very last story is um, we used our vertical scope, which is our parent company's forums, to ask EV owners which legacy brand so existing brand that's been making gas cars for decades is doing the best to tra transition to evs surprisingly or not surprisingly i mean hyundai was voted number one um the surprising thing is with the sort of more startups so you're talking the teslas and rivians and whatnot the percentage of people who picked hyundai or hyundai was actually higher so they recognize of the legacies this is the one doing the best um Kia was also up there, BMW ranked pretty high, and um, Volvo did as well. So hmm. I mean, it's no surprise. It's all the ones that we drive regularly and think, yeah, they're doing a good job at the EVs. I was surprised though Mercedes wasn't up there with all the offerings they have. Well, because they're all jelly beans. <laughs> yeah, maybe. But I mean, the startups are all jelly beans too. It's just maybe they well, think they're too much of a mimic. Do, do the startups count? Because right? they've never had a transition. <laughs> True. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, it's this, this makes sense, right? Like we've we've liked the Hyundai electric cars that we've driven. The ones that share a platform with ICE also do well, like the Kona. And Genesis. yeah, I'm, I, I would go with BMW probably or, or Hyundai. Those are my two picks for personal tastes. All right. Well, this has been a, a long intro, but a lot of there's a lot to cover. And we did. So um, this is the Auto Guide Show brought to you by eBay Motors. We're going to hear from our sponsor again and when we come back we are going to sit down with infinity to talk about the new qx80 and its changes ebay motors is here for the ride do you remember your first car i sure do i was fresh out of university and i wanted nothing more than a car so i went to some dealers with two things in mind i wanted a tudor coupe and i wanted a manual transmission after looking around i finally ended up with a 2003 oldsmobile alero coupe with a five-speed manual and a four-cylinder engine. A lot of people didn't understand why I bought that car, but I loved it. I would take it everywhere. I also wanted to modify it. I put a lot of parts on that didn't work. I put on some wheels and they ended up ripping apart my rear brakes and I had to get rid of them. My intake, my exhaust, my suspension, and some interior bits were all custom made. It would have helped so much if there was some sort of way that I could get guaranteed parts for my car back then. Another thing I loved to do with the car was I would take it drag racing. I do low 15 seconds and thought I was so fast, which I wasn't. But you know what? I was having a blast and I was getting to run the car harder than I was allowed to on the street. I also went to a lot of charity car shows, road trips, and weeks up at the cottage. I had the car for almost two years until one day it was written off in a snowstorm in Detroit by a mail truck. It was a sad day and I really missed that car. One day, maybe I'll get another Alero, but for now, I'll just have good memories of this car and how much fun I had with it. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you can make sure your ride stays running smoothly. Brake kits, LED headlights, roof rack, bumpers, whatever your baby needs, eBay Motors has it. 
And with the eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. All right, welcome back. We have a special guest now from Infinity USA. If you could introduce yourself and what you do for the company. Thank you, Mike. Good morning. I appreciate you having me on board. My name is Craig Keyes. I am the group vice president of the Americas for Infinity. All right, sounds good. Um, so it's looking like it's going to be a pretty uh, busy spring for you guys. Um, starting off, we have this all new vehicle we're going to talk about today. So it's the the much changed QX80. It's uh, probably the biggest update to the vehicle since it was launched. Um, one of the big changes is there's no more V8. So how are you going to address the say more traditional customer that might not be as open to getting a turbocharged V6 compared to a V8? So you're, you're right. It's going to be a very busy spring <laughs> for a lot of reasons, right? I mean, uh, we, uh, we're actually closing the fiscal year and launching a new fiscal year. Uh, at the same time as we are launching this all new product, the model year 25 QX80. And there are a substantial number of changes, not only uh, in design, uh, in the embedded hospitality and technology, uh, but to your point, the uh, the powertrain uh, as well. And the uh, the turbo engine, uh, the V6, going uh, away from the uh, the V8, uh, should actually provide a solid benefit to our consumers. Um, the world as we know it is focused on uh, emissions, compliance, powertrain evolution, and we are pulling more efficiency out of our engines. We don't have the EPA estimates uh, yet, but we, uh, we believe we'll see a 20% uh, improvement in, uh, in efficiency going from the V8 to the V6. And when I think about the power that we'll ultimately pull, from the V6, it's pretty impressive, Mike. Uh, we'll get 450 horsepower, which is solid improvement, uh, as well as uh, class leading 516 pound feet of torque. And so I think those uh, those enthusiasts, uh, once they get in the vehicle, check it out, test drive it and feel the immense power coming out of the engine, uh, they'll be quite satisfied if not, uh, if not feeling very good about their choice. Yeah, I'm never one to uh, shy away from having more power. So I'm looking forward to testing it out. It's not like the old uh, vehicle was lacking, but um, and it's not just more power to be more low end usable power, which is always nice. Uh, so you mentioned the segment, which kind of leads to my next question. Not everyone in the luxury world plays in this segment. How important was it for Infinity to remain in this sort of more traditional large body on frame truck based um, SUV? Yeah, it's a great question, Mike, um, because, you know, when you think about the FSUV segment, it's a small portion of, uh, of luxury. It hovers in that 8 to 10 percent range uh, at different moments in time. Uh, but what I'll tell you is um, wealth concentration uh, is dynamic. And I think you see uh, some inelastic demand uh, at the higher the household income climbs. And if COVID taught us anything, uh, having a luxury commodity where people that uh, live in that inelastic uh, bubble uh, operate uh, is a benefit to an organization because those consumers don't stop necessarily consuming. Uh, but the key is that they want a solid product that is um, durable, um, it's quality, um, it uh, ultimately is embedded with technology that makes uh, and fits their lifestyle, makes their lifestyle easier. And so those are the key elements uh, of, of wanting to ultimately uh, continue to play in that space. And quite frankly, from the prior generation, elevate the stature of the vehicle as well. We think uh, by elevating the stature, it'll produce a halo effect for Infinity. Uh, I want to make sure that we are putting Infinity back on the map in terms of a true luxury competitive offering in the landscape. And this is the SUV that's going to help us do that. 
Sounds good. Yeah, and this is sort of the segment still. If you, if you want to tow a substantial trailer, it's always uh, the best to kind of go with these sort of products. And um, so I can't remember how long ago you first introduced it, but you had the QX80, uh, the monograph concept, right? Is that what it was called? Yeah, it was. It was the QX monograph concept, and we we debuted it uh, last year in uh, it was it was August, late July, August at uh, at Pebble Beach. So, how much of that made its way into this design? Man, just uh, I get I get excited and energized uh, when people compare it to the monograph because it looks essentially the same. Yeah. Right. Uh, we didn't really show the interior. It was more of a, a box. So th you didn't get to see the interior um, during the, uh, the the tour of the monograph concept. Um, but I think from an exterior standpoint, if you put them side by side, they look almost identical. Right. And to me, you know, Infinity has always been recognized as bringing forth some fantastic concepts that never really made it to market. And so to be to actually be able to bring a concept and a design to life uh, is fantastic. And then when you complement it with the wonderful interior, all the accoutrements, the fantastic leather, uh, the 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 hospitality in all three rows, considering all passengers, the partnership with Klish, the individual audio. I, I mean, there's just so much embedded in the interior. That uh, that moving from concept to uh, to design and keeping the uh, commonality on the exterior is almost just the uh, the expectation, the baseline. Yeah, next to the engine, and I think what's in your picture are the seats, and that um, it's, it's a small thing, but I really want to chest out that front view, full double screen view. Those are just two little things that yeah, interest me, so I can't wait to try those out. Um, which may be part of what my next question is. You're obviously taking the fight to the the American luxury brands that you know this has sort of been their space, and you've been doing it for years. What do you think sets this apart from, say, the the Escalades, the the Navigator Ls, and whatnot? Yeah, that's that's a great question because they they dominate the space, and they uh, they ultimately have uh, a large portion of the market share, and uh, and so you know I think uh, we we obviously uh, want to pick up our our market share we believe that we can double it with this this product and so you know what uh, makes me confident that we can actually accomplish that it uh, it goes back to three pillars uh, one the design I think you sit the vehicle side by side do anything anything that's out there and it looks beautiful right so so that's one the second pillar uh, would be the drive I think the performance is going to speak for itself when you put it side by side with the other products. And then uh, thirdly is the uh, the omatanashi, the hospitality, the Japanese hospitality that's embedded in the vehicle. When you talk about the uh, the technology that you'll see in the vehicle and uh, juxtapose that to the pricing, because the pricing is competitive for what you get. It starts at 82, 4, 50. Uh, and then tops out in the uh, in the 110 range, but again, all the technology that's embedded in the feet in the vehicle, all the performance that uh, you expect from Infinity, uh, coupled within just an amazing design, is what gives me the confidence that uh, we will compete, uh, and not only compete, we will chip away at uh, at market share that uh, that our competitors currently hold on to. That's Good to hear. Um, I'm going to kind of skip ahead to my next two questions since we're kind of talking about uh, the technology and interior. Uh, there seems to be a big emphasis here with the sort of the, the experience inside of the car um, or sorry, the SUV. So there's like the two big 14.3 inch screens. Um, the infotainment system had a lot of coverage in the write up. Like how important is that? It obviously sounds pretty important. And and how have you developed that importance over time? Like, what have you learned from your customers that they want this sort of experience? Yeah, I, I think just just look at how we interact with our phones, right? I think uh, we are uh, acutely uh, in tune with uh, with digitization, and the the I guess I'd say the three places where it's most important are you know not only at home, uh, but 
on yourself, right, as you're moving with your phone and uh, and inside your car, inside your vehicle, inside your SUV. And those uh, those three moments uh, certainly should feel like they're in concert with uh, with one another. And uh, that's why we focus a lot on interior hospitality, because just as much time as you spend uh, in the house, you spend, you know, similarly in the uh, in the car, especially for those consumers that do have interest in F SUV, uh, they typically have a pretty active lifestyle. And so we want to make sure there's a seamless cohesion between the technology that they're using every day uh, in their vehicles. And I think, uh, you know, you point to the two 14 inch screens and, uh, and all the technology and the Google interface uh, that's embedded in the, in the vehicle. You know, I'm even thinking about how we can make that learning curve seamless for the consumer, right? Should we be thinking about uh, a second delivery where we send one, someone to your home and actually spend as much or as little time as you want going through a second round of, uh, of explanation and interface with the features in the vehicle. Um, I just believe that making sure that there's a cohesion between someone's lifestyle as they're transitioning from home office into the vehicle is, uh, is super important. And that was one of the key drivers. Yeah, my previous experience working for an OEM, um, I was in the tech space where I was helping develop. And what you said was always a big question for us too, is how do we get the consumers to learn the technology? Because there's so much, like it's not like the old days where you get a car and as long as you can twist the dial to tune the radio, you're set. Like <laughs> as someone who reviews cars, every time I get in a car, I find I'm spending more and more time just sitting in it, you know, learning everything before I drive because I need, need to get it. So that is a challenge is how do you get the knowledge across because once people learn how to use it it's great but there's always sort of that well i don't know how to use that i'm just not going to learn about it so yeah so uh the, the google built in and people with alexa like things like that i think is is going to help because you'll be familiar with how you are how you already use it um Absolutely. so this is i'm not trying to poke at future product but one of your competitors has a uh, a mid-size body on frame truck luxury truck because they have that mid-size pickup platform which you happen to have as well has there ever been any thought that that's a space to investigate or is your line of kind of how it is a, a better approach yeah it's a great question and so you know when you think about um our company as an alliance there's a lot of technology out there that uh, that we can point to what I will tell you for Infinity specifically is last year at the uh, Japan Mobility Show, we confirmed four products. And as I've explained to our retailers, that is simply a baseline because we're always looking for opportunities to meet the client's needs and expectations and move where the industry is ultimately going to end up being. Uh, it's that old, uh, you know, Wayne Gretzky analogy, right? You got to be where the puck's going, right? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily where the puck is. And uh, and I take that to heart. And so we're always going to explore the landscape, Mike. We're always going to look within the organization uh, for opportunities. What I can tell you is today with the, uh, the, the 2025 QX80, we've embedded all the best of which the company has to offer. And so as we move down the line and look at different segments and look at different opportunities to construct uh, maybe new entrants for Infinity, we'll carry that same mindset because we want to make sure that we treat Infinity as a true luxury commodity, a truly competitive brand in, uh, in that luxury space. And in order to do so, so we're going to have to make some of those explorations that, uh, that you mentioned. Oh, sounds good. I unfortunately won't be at the New York Auto Show to see this in person, but okay. Kyle, who's normally on here with me asking questions, he's off on another assignment, but he will be there. So I'll okay. get all the first hand from him, but I do look forward to actually driving it myself down the road. Um, I've, I'm a sucker for big, comfortable, luxurious cars. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Um, we're kind of running out of time. So I thank you very much, Craig, for joining us. This of has course. actually been quite yeah. insightful. You, you let us know a lot of good details on the vehicle and I'm sure you're getting your customers excited for it. Um, and you're hoping it's a big success. 
I am, man. I, I, I really appreciate you giving me some time on uh, on your platform. This week's been super busy. We launched the vehicle at the uh, at the edge uh, at Hudson Yards, a hundred stories up, right, eleven hundred feet above uh, above the street, and it was just an amazing response. Um, we had uh, Aaron Andrews emceeing. You know, we had John Batiste. Uh, but we didn't overshadow the car. And for the people that were there, loved the SUV, loved it. They got to poke around in the interior. They got to play with the uh, the technology. We didn't even mention, you know, the biometric cooling, which is just a mm-hmm. super cool feature. There's just, there's just so much technology in the vehicle. I would really implore everyone to visit infinityusa.com uh, and just explore that tech a little bit more deeply. And uh, look out because uh, in uh, in summer, uh, you'll see the vehicle at your retailers and you'll be able to to test it and get behind the wheel similar to Mike. So thanks again, man. I appreciate your time. Have All fun. right. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Take care. Bye bye. See ya. All right. Well, that was a lot of uh, good news, good information about the QX80. You know, it's one of those, we'll have to drive it to see how it is. The old one went through so many iterations and refreshes and changes some were really good, some were not as good. So I'm really curious, like this is the first time Infinity's really, I think, worked a lot on it. So we'll have to wait and see um, mm-hmm. when we drive it. The, the engine, obviously the biggest deal, but we'll see. So this would be the part where we normally go to uh, viewer questions, but on our last podcast, we didn't really get any questions. We just got a combination of people saying we, don't know we're talking about a Tesla full self-driving and to try it, which we have tried many times and we do know how it works. And the other half were people telling Johnny he should just buy a cover to go inside the glass roof <laughs> of his Rivian and people recommending different versions, which I'm sure he's aware of. But um, that kind of brought me to a quick question that Kyle and I can cover is what is the go-to accessory you need in a personal car? Uh, I'll start. I mean, I've owned more cars than I can count. Every car always has a snow brush uh, because for five to six months, there's a chance we need it. In the summer, it comes out. You know, in that same vein, I've almost always gotten a second set of rubber mats, um, WeatherTech, uh, OEM. I find some of the ones you can just, the one size fits all where you cut, I had those. All they do is just keep a portion of your carpet clean. The rest just gets covered where the water runs off. So it's worth spending the extra money and getting something designed for the car. Um, I'll think of some more of a Kyle. Anything that comes on top of your head? Uh, I, I mean, I, we live with winter half the year basically, so I will agree that a, a brush is absolutely necessary. I will add that because SUVs are now so common, get an extendable brush. Uh, I'm I'm so tired of uh, being behind a vehicle on the highway that has a mountain of snow on top of it, and you're just like, oh, oh no, yeah. oh no, I need to get out of here. Uh, yeah, so yeah, do that. It, it takes a minute to clear the roof. Um, the other thing sort of related to that that I would say is kind of a an overlooked one is an extra set of gloves. Uh, keep those in the car because you never know if you're just going to need them, even in the summer, right? In case you have to change a t- uh, like a wheel and, and there's a bunch of grime somewhere because it's raining. You just, anything to protect your hands and also just keep things clean. I, I think that's a, a smart one that I try to keep in my cars. There's a lot of people who have them just for pumping gas because uh, sometimes those handles are covered in gas and grease and whatnot. Um, mm-hmm. I, another one, because of the age and quality of cars I like to drive, because I always want something old and obscure, jumper cables, they're always in my car because thankfully I've used them more to jump people than myself, but you never know. I used to always get um, the you know the auxiliary power, the, the nine volt. I'd get one of the things that converted it into a regular three prong plug. So mm-hmm. if I went camping or I used to have a CDU and I had to do work on it, I could plug in. Don't need that as much because a lot of things have that adapter or USB or a lot of vehicles have a three prong plug. Um, yeah, I I still just being a car person have a tire gauge in my glove box and flashlight and then other stuff. But it's it seems like a, there's not as many accessories as I used to need. Maybe it's just I don't know. I'm living lighter these days. Well, if you have a good uh, roadside assistance membership, that's also a pretty nice thing to always keep on hand. <laughs> yeah, especially when you have these older cars, especially when you break yeah. down on the highway. It's just happening yeah. more times than I like to count. <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, just wrap this up. Um, 
So this week, uh, you were not traveling yet, but then you go away on another trip to drive something. Can you talk about it? I believe I can. Uh, yeah, so we're recording a little early this week because when this comes out, I'm actually going to be between trips. Um, I am going to Barcelona to drive the Hyundai Ioniq 5N, um, one of the cars that I think it's safe to say both of us are very excited about. Uh, one of the most anticipated cars of the year for me. So we're going over there to drive it on the road and the track. And I'm very much looking forward to it. And then I come home for not even a day. And then it's a New York Auto Show week. So I will be in New York seeing a bunch of new vehicles, including the QX80. So I can poke around that and uh, get a little more information on it. Yeah, next week we can cover more of um, how it is. Uh, uh, are you driving anything right now this week? This week, I have the BMW X2, not the one that I drove last month on the first drive, but the lower powered um, X Drive 28. And so far, I'm enjoying it because, I mean, it's a very different setting. Uh, Toronto in March versus uh, Lisbon in February. But so far, one of my biggest complaints about the X2 was that it rode too stiffly in M35i form, and this one fixes it. And I think it's a pretty good-looking vehicle. It doesn't look particularly like a BMW anymore. But um, yeah, even my wife, uh, she saw it and was like, oh, yeah, it's, it's good. It's got a nice red paint. It's So far, it's a really great city car. Yeah, and I'm in the Toyota Crown Platinum, which is the top line, which gets the max hybrid engine. Uh, well, yeah, engine slash battery motors uh you know what it really transforms the car and i won't get into too much detail now and i'll wait for when i do the review but it's one of those large vehicles where in regular form it's like oh yeah it's it's a nice large car for passengers and you're getting good efficiency and it does its thing but put this extra power into it um and just i don't know it just transforms it uh, very similar to when the Charger goes from V6 to Hemi or some of the older cars got their upgraded engines. I'm not saying it's like those, but it's a very similar feeling where it, it feels like a very different car. Mm -hmm. um, it still looks unique, I'll say. <laughs> a lot of <laughs> neighbors are like, what is that? Uh, and it has 21-inch wheels, two-tone, which from the profile look ridiculous. It, it almost looks like it's on donks. They're so big for the car. I get it fits the overall design language and the feel, but... It, it almost looks um, cartoonish from the side. Yeah. It's just just how sleek the cars and these giant wheels. I mean, it really looks like a car from the future, which I'm sure is what Toyota was going for. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm going to drive it a lot in the next couple of days. So uh, I look forward to saying more once I, I cover it. I look forward to it. And then next week, while you're in New York, I get to stay home and I have a Jetta GLI, one of my favorite um, fun little sedans. And I, I believe it's a manual, too which is uh, a rarity these days. So I'm really looking forward to that week. Hopefully the weather gets better. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll have lots to say next week. We'll, we'll have Kyle back again after a week of not Kyle and a week before that without me. He may or may not be home. He might be doing it from the auto show, but you'll have to wait till next week. Yeah, I look forward to it. All right, well, thanks again for joining us. This has been the Auto Guide Show brought to you by eBay Motors. Uh, until next week, we'll see you later. So long ebay motors is here for the ride your elbow grease fresh installs and a whole lot of love transformed 100,000 miles and a body full of rust into a driveway entirely its own brake kits led headlights whatever you need ebay motors has it and with the ebay guaranteed fit it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time every time or your money back plus at these prices you're burning rubber not cash keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com eligible items only exclusions apply